Welcome to the current federal tax developments for the week of August the 31st, 2020. Current federal tax developments are brought to you by Kaplan Financial Education and your state society of CPAs. This week, we're going to take a look at uh, a week that had developments that mainly the big ones occurred, and there were two big ones. One occurred the first day of the week on Monday. The other one occurred on the last day of the week on Friday. So we're going to talk about those two big things affecting both the payroll tax holiday and the Paycheck Protection Program loans and forgiveness issues, including some news that, well, one part will be welcome to many people listening to this. Other parts will be somewhat less than welcome to many listening. We also finally got some guidance on the payroll tax holiday rules. And as one uh, one person quoted by an article, quoted an article that was published on Tax Notes Today, describing it is uh, essentially summed up the guidance as confirming our worst fears. So we'll see what, why is this person concerned that we've confirmed our worst fears and what exactly should we t- take from what we know about the payroll tax holiday that's scheduled to begin on September 1st. And is that a bit overblown? We'll take a look at how that goes. We'll also have a couple of other developments this week that we'll go into. Uh, We get an expanded version of using electronic signatures for a limited number of forms. We also got a weird ruling, which is one of the first we're going to talk about, that tells us that getting paid for services is income in Bitcoin, which we kind of knew. And probably the more interesting aspect of that ruling is trying to figure out why it was issued which probably goes into some sort of prosecution coming up. There's speculation of that, too, on this morning's tax notes today. But we'll talk a little bit about that as we get closer. So let's go ahead and start with that. Now, this is Chief Counsel Advice 2020-35011, issued on August the 28th of this year. And it relates to crowdsourcing sites, where a crowdsourcing site is on the net, where we go ahead and we have some something to be done and we want to see and get people to do it. Now, in this particular case, we're going to be doing what's called micro tasks. These are simple, menial tasks that require some human interaction. And in most cases, the payments are very small per unit of work, usually less than a dollar. In this particular case, this micro, you know, task, uh, crowdsourcing, whatever, is being asked about was paying people out in convertible virtual currencies. That's kind of like Bitcoin. Well, okay, maybe that that's fine. And I don't think it'll surprise anybody that that's considered taxable, right? And not changed due to a small amount or the use of virtual currencies wouldn't change that. But then again, why would we think it would? Well, you know, there's a real question. This is such an obvious ruling. You get paid for services, you have income, and the fact you got paid in Bitcoin, it's still income. Seems like most likely, and the speculation that was in today's article is, that this may very well be the IRS's criminal division uh, looking to get a formal ruling, or at least not really formal, it's a CCA, but to get on paper a ruling that's going to help them in documenting a prosecution. Because interesting enough, there were some odd things here talked about being paid for these, you know, micro payment or these payments for micro tasks, uh, dealing with things like downloading a particular app from an app store, leaving a positive review, including a comment. Okay, that doesn't sound dodgy at all, right? Paying people to download apps and leave positive reviews. Uh, you know, there may be some sort of criminal prosecution that they're trying to get a tax angle in as well. Because, you know, we all know the story, right, of, you know, trying to shut down Al Capone. And while Al did a lot of things, the one thing they could finally charge Al with was, you know, violating the tax law. And the theory is that, okay, maybe maybe we can do that here. I suspect, and I think the suspicion of those in the article is, there is some dodgy something out there. Uh, and like I said, dodgy sites that are, you know, committing various frauds, uh, downloading apps and, you know, doing things, all of these things, you know, competing quiz. Okay, registering accounts with online services, potentially registering accounts with credentials and with IDs that you've stolen. That might be part of it, too. You know, but there's something there that's dodgy that they may think they have some problem proving intent, but they could prove they weren't reporting it for tax purposes. So that's likely what this is. But again, if anybody ever tells you that, oh, no, that, that stuff's not taxable, 
because, you know, I, it's less than $600. I can get a 1099. It's like, no, that's not how it works. And actually, th this one literally kind of helps you say, yeah, look, it's less than a dollar. It's still taxable. So if you ever have that with a client, you can use it for that. But as noted, probably it's being used for something very different. Uh, the real reason why it exists, because this was such an obvious point. You just have to kind of go there. Now, let's go to our first payroll tax holiday notification. And to be honest, this one, for a while yesterday, this looked like the one thing that would be the only thing I'd have to talk about, about the upcoming payroll tax holiday. When I got up yesterday morning, I was looking at what we had for developments to talk about this week, and it was looking mighty sparse. In fact, I just, you know, we, didn't, we just barely that morning got the micro payments development out there, and that was kind of one of the big things of the week. There were some other things, but they really aren't of broad interest. Like we had a case come down that dealt with the domestic production activity deduction, which, of course, you realize doesn't exist anymore. And it was even so doesn't exist, not exactly very useful for planning. And we're done preparing returns on that. So it's going to be a exam defense thing for the most part at this point. And even weirder was it was a company that did seismic recordings. And the question is eventually decided by the court that part of what they did was engineering services and could count that way. So, yeah, it was that obscure, but I was down to having to look at that. So we came up with this weird story, though, that came up. And it's interesting only because uh, the, the way it ran and what finally happened shortly after this organization reversed. And you got to learn something a little bit. This is the National Finance Center customer notification for the deferral of the old age survivor and disability insurance deductions. Now, you might say, well, I don't care. Who's that? Well, it turns out it's part of the Agriculture Department. Okay. And then it turns out, apparently, that this is a very important department that not just for Agriculture Department employees, but apparently for employees of all kinds of federal agencies. For whatever reason, this agency sitting in the Agriculture Department is handling payrolls for tons of agencies outside the Agriculture Department. In any event, what this organization did was published, well, they published a letter on the 21st. And that letter on the 21st created a bit of an issue. And that's not the letter if you're looking at the, uh, at the screen right now, as I recall. This isn't really the letter that, that we had. It was the actual letter number there is NFC 1597683008. We're going to talk about the, which is actually, I guess actually it is the same number. We got that back, same NFC. We had two versions of this, one that was re released on the 21st, one that was released on the uh, 28th. And this one announced in the 21st letter, this organization for the federal government announced it would begin deferring the withholding of employee, the employee FICA, old age survivor and disability insurance for employees beginning in September. Now, we all remember that on August 8th, the president signed a memorandum that directed Treasury to provide, you know, to basically come up with a program where employers would not be, you know, we could defer, I think it's the way it's phrased, the withholding of that employee payroll taxes, but nothing had happened as of yet. And so at the point this was issued at the 21st and running all the way through when tax note, when tax notes kind of brought it up, tax notes today brought it to everybody's attention. And there were some discussions with certain individuals commenting on whether this worked. You know, it just was sitting there. There was no guidance. Now, pretty much everybody had come to the conclusion that was been commentating for the moment was, well, look, we need the Treasury guidance because all the president said was Treasury, it create this program. Well, we still have a program because Treasury hadn't created the program yet. But this organization was moving forward. So th this was kind of the hot topic of that morning. And later, about midway through the day, they issued new guidance, which said, OK, no, 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 we, we, we are you know, once we have guidance, we may start yeah, not withholding this. OK, good. So they backed down, got back to where we all were, which was just in time for what was the big thing that happened. So this sets all this up. And what happened, this was, I believe, right at five o'clock Eastern on Friday. 
right, right at or right just after. Notice 2020-65 was posted by the IRS to their website, mail, you know, email went out, etc. This notice implements the president's memorandum of August the 8th. So now apparently the National Finance Center can go back and start working again that they're going to not be withholding these taxes. This particular program, notice 202065, gives us some of the details of how we're going to handle this payroll tax deferral issue. The program is supposed to begin, and it should be September 1st, right? We're going to begin withholding, you know, deferral withholding of employee old age survivor disability insurance beginning September the 1st. So we stop doing that, and it comes through the end of December. The deposits, it tells us, when we're going to do the program this way, it doesn't defer the date for making the deposit because actually there's a reg under 7508A that says you can't use 7508 cap A to delay payments or payroll tax deposits. So what they're doing, and this is part of the creativity Treasury had to go through, is they're actually delaying the requirement to withhold. And since they're delaying the requirement to withhold, I'm not sure 758 Cap A allows that, but j just bear with me. Since the employer doesn't have to withhold, they point out in the footnote that the requirement to pay is tied to the requirement, is tied to when you withhold. Since, you, since we're saying you will not have to withhold these taxes from these wages from September 1st through December 31st, you therefore you haven't withheld the taxes you don't pay the taxes so okay kind of got that we also have this catch well who don't we withhold them from well it's anybody who has a bi-weekly payroll of less than four thousand dollars and if you pay on a different pay period let's say you're weekly or you're by or you're you know you are going to be semi-monthly you would end up adjusting that four grand for the appropriate period, annualize it up, come down by the number of payrolls you'd have. Obviously, for weekly, it's pretty simple. That will be 2000 not 4000 But the, they did then clarify that in implementing the president's rule, they are going to use a per payroll basis for the 4000 So let's say, keep it simple, we're a biweekly payroll. If I have an employee whose payroll for this week under FICA wages, and that they do tell us for sure is how we're testing, is based on the FICA slash Medicare wage inclusion items. If that if their wages are 1980 for the week, then we are going to be able to defer the withholding. Now, I'll get to how you defer withholding in just a second, but we're going to defer it. If their wages for that week are $2,100, we can't defer. So every payroll stands alone. Now, that doesn't answer all questions because one problem we're going to run into at the end of the year for a lot of employers is some employers give employees, you know, things like Christmas bonuses, and they may be a separate check. If you give somebody a separate check for a year end bonus or a Christmas bonus, does that go to a pay period or is that its own item? And if it's its own item, what is its pay period? And how would we handle it? Presumably, at some point, the IRS may give us FAQs or something similar, but that appears to be something that could be a real problem. Now, if you actually just roll that bonus into the final pay periods, check, then I think we're going to have an issue here. You're not going to be able to stop the deferral. But if you issue separate checks, which some organizations will, to keep the regular payroll going like regular, and this special bonus check, remember we have special withholding rates on bonus checks, running separately, yeah, we're not too clear how that would work in this scenario. But we do have it. Now, the theory is once we have this withheld, we're going to turn around and withhold it. You know, now So we're going to run, keep a running total of how much we've not withheld from the employee. And then the theory of this is we will rateably withhold it from the employee's paychecks beginning on January 1st and going through April 30th of 2021. So the idea is that's how we do it. We do it rateably on that period. If any amount is left unpaid 
at April the 1st, or I should say May the 1st, 2020, penalties and interest will be assessed on the employer. Key part about this ruling, 7508 Cap A requires relief be given to an affected taxpayer. The relief is when they have to pay in items. In this case, the ruling defines an effective an affected taxpayer as the employer who's required to withhold. So it's not the employee, it's the employer is the affected taxpayer. And when you read the guidance about repayment and who would pay penalties and interest, it's affected taxpayers that are involved. Because remember, the employee was not an affected taxpayer, the way this is written. Rather, the employer was. So the employee is not the one delaying the payment of tax. Well, kind of. Rather, it's the employer. So if it's not repaid, the employer has to cough up the money. Okay, great. Well, I'm going to withhold it from my employee's paychecks. Aside from the fact they're going to be paying, if they're paid the same amount every pay period, they're going to go from, let's say, like, because we talked about this, the U.S. Department of, or I should say U.S. Chamber of Commerce gave us the numbers a week ago that if somebody had a $50,000 payroll annually, you know, I pay 50000 a year, that we would expect them to have just under $1,200 of FICA they wouldn't receive. Well, so let's take that kind of average employee, therefore. So let's say make a little bit less than 50. So your amount of FICA that would normally be taken out of your paycheck every month is $150. Okay, great. So for the, for, for the four months from September, October, November, December, that employee will have $250 more, right? Their paychecks will go up by $250 for the month, right? Or at least works out that way on a monthly basis. Okay, great. But come January 1st, 2020, first payroll, 2021, I should say, the first payroll we are going to end up issuing to that employee on 2021, that payroll is going to be $500 less in net, right? Because the 250 is going to come back that would normally be withheld in that month from their payroll. And then we're going to put on top of that another 250. So their monthly cash flow is going to go up, going to go up by 250 in September. Then we'll drop by 500 in January. And then in May of next year, we'll go back up by 250 to where it was here in August. Needless to say, that is probably going to create some issues with some employees. But that's the way this works. Now, you might think, okay, but what, what happens if the employee quits on January 1st? What happens to employees we are hiring as seasonal employees? Because let's say we're somebody like UPS or FedEx. We're going to have to have a lot more delivery people, I think especially this year, uh, to handle the holiday season. And obviously, the number we need come January will drop dramatically. So we have these seasonal employees. Well, they're not paid more than $4,000 per payroll normally, per biweekly payroll. So they'll qualify for this deferral. But they're not going to be on the payroll at all in 2021. How do we deal with that? And the only thing this thing tells us to do, the only thing the notice gives us, is it says, oh, you may make arrangements if necessary, to collect the balance. Well, yeah, it's going to be necessary, other arrangements. We're going to make some other arrangements because we can't withhold it because they're not, we're not paying them a paycheck in 2021. Either because, you know, it's a seasonal, they just won't be there, because they quit, right? Because they're terminated for cause. For whatever reason, they won't be there. Well, other arrangements, well, that'll be interesting to see how you make those. And even better will be whether you could collect on them anyway. I think there'll be some complications with some state labor laws about whether you even could have had such an agreement in place. Will that be allowed by the state labor rules? And secondly, even if it's allowed, the odds of you having collection problems go through the roof and the cost of pursuing collection will be way higher than the amount involved. So bottom line, it's going to be the employer who's on the hook for the taxes. If we can't withhold enough, the employer is going to have to pay the taxes. That's simply how this is going to work. So 
That raised an interesting question. Well, what do we do about that? Well, here's what's interesting about it. Now, we've had some back and forth conversations on tax Twitter in the last uh, few hours, last 12 hours or so, a little over 12 hours since this came down. And pretty much everybody says, well, you say two things, obviously. Number one, it does not say the notice has no direct comment on whether employers have to or don't have to participate in the program. And most will say that realistically for a program like this, which is supposed to be relief for the employer, it would seem like, just like with the relief for filing that moved April 15th to July 15th, that didn't mean people couldn't file on April 15th. It appears that employers, and it appears the choice is in the hand of the employer, will be able to decide I'm not doing this. Now, it may not be much of a decision either because I don't know that a lot of payroll systems and payroll services will be ready to handle this in time to handle the first payroll in September that should have the FICA not taken out. So I think there'll be a number of employers where whether they want to participate or not, their systems will not be able yet to allow them to participate. So we'll see a lot of issues like that. As well, you know, there is a problem. Some of your employees may not like the fact of seeing their payroll, yeah, go up by 250, but then knowing that they're going to drop by 500 a month in January, they're going to say, forget that. Can, can I can I opt out? Nothing here seems to stop an employer from choosing which employees participate, which don't. So you could ask an employee, you know, you could ask your employees, do you want to participate in this? And if you do, the ones that do, you turn this on. The ones that don't, you don't. Uh, doesn't really save you if the ones that do quit. But, you know, whatever. It appears you'd be allowed to go that way. But there is nothing here that appears to allow an employee to control what the employer does. And that means both if an employer decides we're just not doing this and you've got an employee that wants the 250 that wants to have it, and I'll pay it back next year, the employee does not appear to have any way to force an employer to do it. And conversely, if you're an employee that says, I don't want to owe the government money, don't take it out. There's no way to force the employer not to take it out. The employer, you know, or basically to force the employer to take it out. The problem is going to be that you can't really make the employer do anything. So it's a bit of a problem, right? One of those issues. Uh, forgiveness is still to be sought, will be sought by somebody going to Treasury, which can create its own, pro by Treasury, by going to Congress. Congress is going to have to make the decision to forgive or not. That has its own problems because it is far from clear that Congress will do this or will want to do this. The problem we're going to have here, now, obviously, this is going to put a lot of pressure on Congress to forgive. But the flip side of that is, Congress had been balking, and this was being balked by people on both sides of the aisle. We're just not very thrilled overall with the payroll tax holiday. We didn't see anybody really going all the way and saying, yep, we got to have that, except the White House. And remember, in the, in the bills up to now, the White House has stated every time that a payroll tax holiday was an absolute requirement for the president's signature, and the Congress ignored the president and gave him a bill that didn't have it. So apparently now he has decided to throw down the gauntlet. And what this will do is, the theory is at least force the issue. Whether Congress responds properly is a different question. There is some concern that Congress, this now becomes more of a Congress versus the presidency issue, will not want to embolden either the current or future president to be able to do something like this again to try to backdoor around Congress and force their hands. So they may very well let this crash and burn. And the problem is, until something's passed and signed, you got to tell people there is a chance it will crash and burn and we will have to actually have forgiveness in there. So this really complicates the planning and so does the possibility of forgiveness complicate the planning. So it makes it a bit of a problem. Now, the interesting side for this that I have, and I was going to say, I had something here, but I don't know that I've got 
got it in here. Maybe, yes, I do. I know it got moved to the wrong side of it. I got the wrong place. There was an interesting article in Tax Notes this morning. And I, I love the quote from Vina Mur Murthy of Crow LLP. And her statement was, her, him or her, I can't remember which state, you know, it's like, because by the way, I do not know, I wondered if they were on Twitter, so I basically searched for Vina Mur Murthy's, and I found Vina Murthy's that are both male and female, so I apologize to Vina, but I don't really know for sure which way to refer, so we'll just leave it that way, and I don't think I found the right Vina, I don't, don't think the Vina Murthy that is with Crow is on Twitter because it's anything obvious, any obvious place that somebody looked to be you know, in a professional firm with tax as the thing that the Venas were apparently doing. I just didn't realize there'd be that many of them, but there are, so we got them. But it has a great one-liner. It's excellent guidance from the standpoint that it confirms everyone's worst fears. And the problem that Vena is getting at here, though, is, A, obviously for employees, they're going to face that double withholding in January. That will probably come as a surprise to some, right? They won't necessarily be able to deal with it well. So if you follow this, they're going to have the double withholding. If you don't follow it, right, if the employer says we're not doing it, then you're going to have some employees who are going to hear on the news, on TV, that, hey, wait, the president said I'm getting this extra money. Why didn't I get it? Why are you stealing from me? Okay. So we're going to have that problem. We also have the problem with the employer. You know, ultimately, does the employer get stuck holding the bag? So there are a lot of problems with the program. We don't know how it works. And like, and the other question which I'd raise right away is, what happens if an employee does leave? The amount that they don't pay back, let's say they stiff the employer, is that more wage income to them? Taxable? And then, but then the other problem is, if it's taxable, is are are those FICA wages? And then does the employer get stuck with having to give FICA wages on the FICA wages? Yeah, you can see how that gets messy. So we're not quite sure how this will all work. Yes, it's bad. No, we don't know how it works. So it's an issue. We'll have to kind of work with it. What are you doing come Monday or come Tuesday? Like I said. For a lot of a lot of clients and a lot of you listening, it's probably going to be out of your hands for at least a few weeks, if not a couple of months, until your payroll service or your software vendor or your own internal systems are able to up, be updated to handle this no withholding, assuming you're going to do it. Can you just say we're not doing it? I expect a lot of companies to do that. In fact, uh, there, there was a reporter for the Wall Street Journal who covers tax, where Richard Rubin was actually on Twitter trying to find an employer who's going to do it. You know, he wanted to interview somebody who's going to do it on Monday, aside, who's going to do it in the month aside from the federal government. And I don't know that he's succeeded yet in finding that person. If he does, I'm sure there'll be an interview on it. But it's like I expect a lot of employers are going to punt on Tuesday. And at least initially not going to do it. We'll see if Treasury balks at that or starts telling people you have to do it. So we got all those issues. Really still keep an eye open. Obviously, this came out late on Friday. And I'll be honest, I don't think that's a coincidence. Late on Friday, you bring things out late on a Friday because they tend not to get into the news cycle. Uh, you hope that by Monday, you know, everybody's forgotten about it. And people didn't read about it. Monday, they're reading about whatever happened late on Sunday. So you kind of hope this sneaks by with anybody noticing. And why would you want this to sneak by? Because we knew from the 8th of August that the problem here was going to be how do we deal with the repayment side of this and who's on the hook. And that's that was always going to turn out not happy. So for the most part, that's why you didn't really want to spend a lot of time on it. That's why a late Friday guide. So, hey, it's what, what we have. So we'll have to move forward from there. Next, this is kind of useful, uh, kind of important. It did come out recently, which, hey, I'm all for this too. Uh, th this was basically a memorandum 
uh, from Sunita Lowe, Deputy Commissioner for Services and Enforcement uh, from the IRS, uh, for memorandum for all services and enforcement employees, temporary deviation from handwritten signature requirements for a limited list of tax forms issued on August 27th. It includes provisions that will modify temporarily parts of the Internal Revenue Manual, which, of course, you know, the IRS uses for operations. What happens in this is the IRS has expanded and liberalized temporarily the use of electronic signatures and digital signatures. Now, it's only for a very limited subset of forms and only for that, you know, small, short period. In a footnote, though, what was interesting was they did not specify how you had to get the e-signatures. In fact, it seems to allow virtually any e-signature system to be used for this purpose because they were very, very broadly in their footnote. Now, the author did note that the IRS understands that there are risks with accepting electronic signatures. And clearly, the biggest risk is, one big risk is, Obviously, somebody could easily fraudulently sign an e-signature. There's not the physical pen and paper. They could obviously forge a signature. But there's a lot easier time proving forged signatures. It may be much tougher discovering if we have a forged e-signature situation as to when that happened. And that could be because somebody may try, first thing is obviously, to file something that they shouldn't fraudulently. But the flip side of that is it could be that somebody will try to get out of, let's say, criminal prosecution by arguing once they're in trouble that, oh, well, I didn't really do that. I wasn't the one that signed that. I mean, I'm you know, just, just sorry I wasn't. So, you know, even though the return was fraudulent, and even though obviously the benefit of the fraudulent return came to me, I never really signed that. So, yeah, the IRS sees problems. So it is a very limited list of forms for a short period of time. It does say that they will revisit the issue once, you know, they finish this up. So once, once this is over, they'll take a look at this experience and maybe consider going to a simpler e-signature format in the future. But for right now, this only runs for this period. So it's items postmarked from August the 28th, 2020 through December 31st, 2020 can use that. Now, the forms that are covered for this. You can go, and the idea of this is, you know, you complete a return, the client needs to, you know, mail in and sign, let's say, one of the first things they put here is a change of accounting method. Well, you know, the client's supposed to sign that, and also we have a, and, you know, that may go electronically, so that electronic signature counts of sorts, but the other problem is the client normally also needs to sign, and we have to send in a paper copy that goes to the IRS. Well, now it'll be faxed in. But we need a basically pen and ink hand signature on, on that form. Well, right now with social distancing, it may not be as simple to get that signed. You know, in, in essence, the client can't just come over, sign the form with you sitting there, you know, showing them where to sign. Rather, the client's going to you know, the client is either going to have to mail it to them and hope they can get it back to us and hope that all processes in time to get it mailed out timely, you know, or they're going to have to mail it, which may be a problem after they sign it. So the idea is, though, no, rather we're going to let, you know, we're going to let them use like an e-signature platform, write signature or Adobe signature format, you know, one of those things you have. We're going to let them do that. And that electronic signature that you, for instance, in Acrobat, the, at least if you have a, the Creative Cloud, or at least you have, I should say, you don't have to have Creative Cloud, but you have to have the version of Acrobat that you subscribe to. So the single application version of Creative Cloud, you can actually send the signatures through there, right? You have an, a signature system there. I'm not sure I like it that much. And it doesn't have knowledge-based authentication built in which has made it not outside of what we'll talk about here in just a second, acceptable for e-file authorizations. But apparently for this program, it will work. So you could use that as your option. So they're going to allow you to do a 3115. And so it can come back, you know, with the electronic signature printed on there. When you get it back and you print it out, it will show the electronic signature was applied, et cetera, have information. So that will be considered acceptable. 
They'll also let somebody use something like that for the 8832. If you want your LLC to be taxed as a corporation, we can get those papers together. Uh, Form 8802, application for U.S. residency, cer residency certification, that can be electronically signed. Uh, the, may, most of these are forms that cannot be filed electronically. That's why they're putting them in this list. Form 1066, U.S. income tax return for real estate mortgage investment conduit. 1120 RIC, the corporate tax return for regulated investment companies. Also in the list is 1120C, the income tax returns for cooperatives. Uh, the REIT version of the 1120 for real estate investment trust. The L version for life insurance company income tax returns. The PC version for property and casualty insurance company income tax returns of 1120. And finally, this is interesting, uh, the individual e-file authorization forms. For the series for Form 8453 variants, 8878, which is for your extensions. Yeah, remember, 8453 is when you have attachments that you need to send in, paper attachments that we're sending in if you're still going that route. Uh, the 8878 is authorization for the extensions. You need, if you win the cases where those need to be signed and approved. And the obviously the 8879 is the main e file form. Now, that's interesting because at least the last one, and I, as I recall, all of them, when the signature was needed, well, except for the 8453, I suspect, uh, you could already get them electronically signed. There was an e, there were e-signature standards for those. But the key difference was that that e-signature program requires you to have knowledge-based authentication before you could use it. So they had to go through the KBA program or otherwise prove who they were. Now, if they came to your office, they could prove who they were before they signed. But obviously, coming to your office and presenting evidence is a bit more of a problem right now. So they're going to say temporarily, it appears what's going to happen here is you can use an e-signature platform that does not support KBA, knowledge-based authentication. So it appears for at least through the end of the year. Now, remember, once the end of the year hit, we get to January 1st, 2021, unless the IRS extends this program, we're not going to be able to use those items for after that date. December 31st is the last day for mailing something where you're going to be trying to use this method. Finally, the, we got guidance to start the week. And like I said, for a long time, it's the only guidance I was really looking at this week. This comes from the SBA. This is a new interim final rule, RAN 3245-AH56. Business loan program, temporary changes, paycheck protection program, treatments of owners, and forgiveness of certain non-payroll costs. It came out on the 24th of August. And what this deals with is, it's three big, it's three areas that it deals with. And generally, there's going to be guidance in here I know some of it you're not going to like at all. Uh, another part, may you may consider it good news, you may consider it bad news, depending upon how you are interpreting what the SBA meant by owner. It's so like owner employees for purposes of limiting, you know, limiting your amount you could take as pay for forgiveness to 2.5 months of the prior year's amount of pay you had received. Uh, and obviously limited by the 100000 annualization. But as I would say, that is not really a problem for owner employees because that annualization limit applies to anybody. So, But the problem of 2.5 months of last year is a problem, as well as you know, for owner employees, in many cases, you may not be able to count separately the amounts that were paid to them uh, or that were paid on their behalf for health care, for retirement plans, right? We have limitations. So we'll talk about how that goes. So this notice came out on Monday, the 24th, and it did establish an ownership percentage de minimis amount. Okay, now it's limited. Let's talk about who covered. Generally, the SBA made clear when they talked about owners in the prior guidance, there they said there was no restriction. Any ownership percentage, no matter how small, would make one an owner 
And if uh, being an owner had an impact on the forgiveness calculation, then that person was subject to it. Whatever expenses related to that person had to be subjected to this limitation. Now, the new guidance says, if you are a shareholder, and remember, corporate shareholder, CRS Corp., if you hold, only if you hold 5% or more of an interest in the corporation, are you an owner? So if your ownership interest is less than 5%, you're not an owner, right? That de minimis is involved. Now, that's good news if you thought that everybody was covered. Some people had found on the, for, on the original application form for the loan, language that told us if you, you know, that owners, and this was really for applying and really primarily mattered if an owner had been convicted of a felony. Right. And so the question, because who was an owner and that guidance told you that owners were those that had 20 percent or more. Now, we had no other guidance out there. So a few people decided that, well, that must be all, that must define owner for all context. So if you don't have an interest in the entity of at least 20 percent, you're not an owner. That is not what they went forward with. So if you've been using that 20 percent test and you assume that a, let's say, an, a shareholder that had 10% was not an owner for limiting their allowable expenses for forgiveness, uh, you got to rework that, right? That'll be a problem. The other thing is they don't discuss any other entity types. That means that if you don't hold it in corporate form, but let's say you have an LLC tax as a partnership, the de minimis rule does not appear to apply to them at all because it talks specifically and only about shareholders. So that means in a partnership context, any partner who's a general partner, and that probably means if it's an LLC tax as a partnership, if you're a member manager, you'd be considered a general partner, any ownership interest will cause them to be in the owner class and will cause them to be limited to 25 months of self-employment for the prior year. So there does not appear to be a limitation there. It also raises the quirk because we're told that if you're an LLC, you follow the rules for the entity type you filed as. Well, if an LLC is being taxed as a corporation, then the 5% rule would be in play. If that LLC is being taxed as a partnership or disregarded on an individual return, then, yeah, and obviously if it's disregarded one owner, that's not going to be a problem, not 100%. So let's say it's being taxed as a partnership, then sorry, the guy owns four percent is apparently an, you know going to be a and that's a general partner is going to be treated as an owner for this purpose and subject to limitations. So that's there, better or worse, we now have that issue. Other thing they covered in this same issue were some things dealing with the rental and mortgage non-payroll cost rules. And the first question deals with situations where the business does not make use of the entire space that is otherwise available or is under control of the entity. And in all of these, we generally have to limit our use to areas actually used by the business. So for instance, if you sublet a part of space you rent, so let's say we enter into a rental for a whole building, we don't need the whole building, so we sublet a third of it to somebody else. We cannot count expenses related to the sublet portion of the building, which means we would have to like reduce our rents for that one third. Uh, same thing if we own the building, right? So if we own the space and we only use two thirds and lease out the other third, same rule will be there. Only the two thirds count. Not, not the one-third that we're leasing to other, other entities. That would be considered a rental activity of the, of the business separate from what you were doing, so sublets don't count. Also, if you have more than one business sharing the same space, which could happen quite a bit if you have more than one trade or business. So let's say you've got a trade or business. You've got two separate trades or businesses in there, one of which got a PPP loan. The other one didn't. Or even if they both got one, they got separate loans. Well, you'd have to consider only the allocable portion of the building for that business 
and expenses for that business in order to claim the forgiveness. And specifically, they go back and say, we're going to consider what's allocable to each business by looking at the tax return. What's allowed on the tax return for that business's reporting as opposed to the other business. So we have to exclude there. You know, so we talk about that shared space area. One part, though, that is probably good, they specifically talked about the home office deduction. Now, they do say initially, no, you can't claim the entire interest on your mortgage just because you have an office in the home. But they did say that we would allow you to take expenses that are allowed as payroll costs for the non-payroll costs, which probably would be your mortgage interest. Uh, the portion of that that was allowed on the return for the home office deduction will be allowed as a forgivable expense. So that's good. It will be either based on what you did for 19, or if you didn't have the business opened up in 20, you're one of those new ones and you qualified under those rules, we're going to only use the percentage you expect to use on the 20 return. That'll be our key. Now, the other change, this one, you're probably really not going to like. I don't know of anybody yet who's happy about this. I know a lot of people are not surprised by it, but I don't know anybody happy. Uh, rents paid to an other entity where you have common ownership. You know, the standard type of structure. You've got a construction company, right? You have an office, you know, where all your clerical administrative staff is at. You know, you take phone calls there. You get orders. You know, your staff does things like works up bids there, et cetera. So you've got this centralized site. You've also got some storage there, et cetera. Now, while the construction business is in an S corporation, you probably have that building owned. Let's say if there are three shareholders, you'll have the three shareholders be three partners in a partnership that owns a building, probably in an LLC. Or, you know, or you just whatever you're leasing to that building, you're leasing to that entity where you share common ownership. The two entities share common ownership. In that situation, the non-payroll cost for the rents paid in that case is going to be reduced down to no more than the share of the mortgage interest that's properly allocable to the, to the business operation. So generally, if you did own 100% of the building, right, use entirely in the business, if you paid, let's say, 120000 in rent this year, but, or let's say you paid, you paid well, actually during a short period, let's say you paid 20000 in rent during the covered period, but the, the interest expense for that period on your mortgage is only a 2000 2000 is going to be your forgivable expense. You're not going to be allowed to take any other amounts of that rent as as an expense. And obviously, if you don't have a mortgage because you paid off the building years ago, none of that amounts paid as rents will count. That's going to be their key. You also must have had it in place at February 15, 2020. That's, that's fine. We knew that. The big negative of this, though, is it tells us explicitly any common ownership triggers the rule. So if I have three guys that own the S-Corp, but only one person owns the, uh, let's say, the building. You know, the original owner owns the building. Uh, he's led in a, some new people, but those new people didn't pay in to buy the building. So he's kept the building and leases that. That lease will still be limited the same way, even if by now that original owner only owns, you know, 20% of the business. There's still common ownership between the S-Corp and the rental and we're going to have to get the interest number from the owner to figure out how much we could claim as forgivable expenses, right? It's going to primarily be a problem uh, for entities that were using the eight-week covered period as opposed to 24. Normally, if we're using 24, we're going to let it run all the way out. We have a lot of expenses and probably a lot of payroll expenses may wipe out everything anyway. So if you're running the full 24 weeks, my guess is it'll be less of a problem. But if you are somebody who thought, you know, I needed the eight weeks because we went out of business right after we ran out of money, you know, right after the money ran out from the loan, I can't afford to have this run longer because my FTEs are going down and I can't show that I couldn't restore my business because of CDC guidance that I was forced to follow, you know, whatever that position may be in. Those people may have more of a problem because they may have been betting on the fact that they could pay the rent to themselves as owner, right, and have that count. 
What's really sad at this point is we're past their eight-week period. So they, they can't pay something else now and have it covered. We can't fix it. We didn't know it didn't count till after their eight-week period ended. So that that's a pain. Not good. Now, what we still don't know, we've not heard anything about any sort of, you know, imputed ownership from the fact that, let's say, you know, you, you, you own this comp you own this company. Uh, is your son considered to be an owner employee? If you own 100 percent of the stock, is that person an employee? Is your spouse owner employee? We don't have any of these sort of related party stuff hasn't really been worked out in any detail. This is one of the few things they've done. Now, we didn't have this stuff a week ago. So as I tell people, we don't have any right now. So is it okay to pay the spouse? Says, well, for the moment, it looks like it's okay. But I said, but please remember, a week ago, it looked like it was okay to pay the shareholder for the rents for the building that they're holding outside of the S corporation, that looked perfectly okay and not subject to limits. And then suddenly we discovered that, nope, not okay. Can't do it. So watch for changes. That's becoming more of a problem. I will be doing this week a session for the New Jersey Societies on September 1st. Uh, and we're going to go over PPP loan forgiveness and other COVID-19 developments. Uh, that one's going to run from 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern time. On the uh, first, we will be doing replays on the third and the ninth. They run at different times. I believe the ninth actually runs in the evening. Well, late afternoon, evening. I think it starts at 5 p.m. and goes to 9 Eastern. And I think the other one starts at 10 a.m. and runs to 2 p.m. Eastern time. They're all Easterns. Now, remember, the first program will be live, live. I will be sitting looking at the camera, talking, you know, and interacting with people as they bring questions in. The next two will be replays of the session. So you'll still get answers, right? We'll still be able to give you answers, but those answers are going to come text-based instead of, you know, me being able to answer them on, on the broadcast. So if you want that kind of live, live interaction, the first is the day. Otherwise, take a look at the third and the ninth. Uh, we're crossing our fingers that nothing changes after the 1st and before the 3rd or the 9th. We're betting a little bit on Labor Day being in there and them not wanting to do anything really bad. If they do, we will probably figure out a way to do a little short blurb to explain to you what's changed in the interim. But, you know, take a look at that. Again, it's four hours of CPE, and we're talking about the PPP loan forgiveness programs. This has been the Current Federal Tax Developments for the week of August the 31st. You can get our regular updates online at currentfelltaxdevelopments.com. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, you can email me, Ed Zollers at currentfilltaxdevelopments.com. My handle on Twitter, at Ed Zollers. Uh, also, follow along discussions on the Connect sites for Arizona, New Jersey, Minnesota, Illinois, Washington. Uh, if you want to do those, for those, you generally have to be a member of the State CPA Society to look in on those and participate. But if you are, they're very useful places to get some information, so consider that. Also, uh, I tend to look in on Cal CPA's tax talk from time to time. That one you don't have to be a member of Cal CPA to join. So you can look and see about those. Certainly check with your state society, see if they have such a discussion group because it's a really useful tool if they do. And if it turns out you don't because it takes some work to get it set up and also takes some basic numbers you believe you can attract before it'll make sense, you might want to take a look at the Cal CPA program. Otherwise, I guess better late than never on the guidance. So we have our guidance. You know, we'll see what goes on from there. Uh, we'll see what other things we might get this week. We are going to be rapidly approaching the drop dead due date for flow through entities. So remember that we're hitting September. And again, due dates are going to start coming fast and furious because we're going to go from this to trust and then to individuals, right? Everything's going to be rapid fire. Starting this week, we will be within essentially at least 15 days of a due date, constantly an absolute due date beginning on Tuesday. It'll just start and we'll just keep running with that through the rest of the tax season till we get past October 15th. So yeah, ready for that fun part of the year. Otherwise, look forward to seeing you next week as we discuss more current federal tax developments.